Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Arnold, Executive Director of the Sales Association. Welcome to the Sales Association's Power Sales Webinar with BPM Online. Today you'll learn from Michael Rooney, BPM Online's Senior Vice President and General Manager, how dynamic sales process has helped savvy leaders build a revenue machine. Michael is a proven leader in building effective sales organizations and developing long-term customer relationships. With over $1 trillion spent annually on sales teams, maximizing sales productivity is a critical goal for every enterprise. Recent studies show that firms using sales processes to guide sales activity report 30% greater profit than those that do not. Rapidly changing, highly competitive environments require sales teams to be both bold and agile in order to keep up with the pace of the market. By 2017, 70% of successful businesses are predicted to rely on dynamic processes designed to solve, evolve with customer needs. Helping you succeed in this kind of environment is why we're here. So during this program with BPM Online, you'll get insights on driving smarter sales in a changing business environment. Our monthly webinars are offered free to members of the Sales Association as a member benefit, and because we've had such a great year with the Sales Association, today's program is complimentary to all registrants. At the Sales Association, we believe sales is the ultimate performance-focused profession. Our association is dedicated to improving individual leadership and company sales performance in all industries. For information on joining, visit our website at www.salesassociation.org or call us at 720-259-1250. On behalf of the Sales Association, thanks again to BPM Online for offering this great program, as well as to you, our audience, for participating. And I will let Michael take it over from here. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here, and thanks for the Sales Association for allowing us to present today. I hope you'll find today's presentation informational, interesting, uh, and productive. Uh, I am Mike Rooney. I'm the VP of uh, VP, Senior VP and General Manager here at BPM Online, uh, based out of Boston. We're going to start off with a little poll. Actually, a little housekeeping here. The the Webinar is being recorded, so if you want to see it later on, just uh, contact us. We'll be able to forward it to you, and you can share it with other folks. Uh, we are going to be taking questions uh, throughout, so you'll see a little question tab on your dashboard uh, with GoToWebinar. Feel free to type in um, some questions, and um, and uh, please participate here in this uh, in this quick poll. Basically, we want to set the table by understanding where you're all at with your sales process automation. And in that, I don't mean sales force automation, but the actual process automation. So would you consider yourself total man totally manual, still using spreadsheets and, and uh, writing things down, partially automated, fully automated, or fully automated and integrated with marketing and services as well? So we're looking at some of the results here. Um, actually, it looks like most of the people are right in the middle of the line and saying they're partially uh, automated. Thanks for participating. Please do jump in there and click. And uh, we do have a quarter of the people who say they're totally manual. So this uh, presentation ought to be uh, really good for you, and we'd love to talk to you. <laughs> OK. So I thought I'd start off just by giving you a little bit of a background on who BPM Online is, because I don't necessarily assume that you know who we are. We've actually been in the global CRM market for over a dozen years. Uh, we have offices around the world, uh, mostly in Europe, and uh, headquartered here in Boston in the US. We have about 550 employees at this point, and uh, kind of a unique thing is more than half of them are directly in development. So we have a lot of horsepower working on our products and platforms. We also leverage a lot of partners worldwide, and that's mostly for global reach, uh, implementation bandwidth, and really vertical expertise. We do have 6,000 global clients worldwide, and we've been recognized by a lot of the key industry analysts. You see Forrester, Gartner, and Nucleus here, and down the bottom, just a bunch of awards that uh, we've accumulated. I guess most recently might be the uh, 2015 CRM Magazine uh, Leadership Awards. So we're here to talk about excellence in processes, agile, uh, dynamic processes. So I just want to set the table with a couple of quotes here. 99 out of 100, or most of the business ideas that cross your mind when you're waking up in the shower, on the chairlift, whatever it might be, somebody else is already thinking of and putting in place. 
Today's customers do not accept excuses. A one-time drop in the sales process or customer service process can lead them to abandon ship very quickly. There are no geographic barriers to uh, customers or suppliers uh, these days, and so your process, your platform, needs to be nimble enough to expand and make changes uh, to, to encompass those. And then, of course, pretty much every minute of every day, somebody else is entering the market, whether it is to change the marketplace in how you purchase things or how people offer uh, particular products and services. So the market's moving fast. So we're going to talk about basically the processes that are involved across the entire customer journey. So not just sales, really, but marketing, sales, and service. I'm going to focus a little bit more on sales because I know that's uh, who we're mostly talking to today. But I'm also, also going to hit on a bunch of different statistics and metrics throughout this presentation. I should say that we gathered these from all sorts of sources, mostly public, uh, but they're not off of one particular report or from one uh, particular analyst or website. Uh, I just feel like it's, it's more engaging when you get some snippets uh, of information and it kind of colors the story a little bit better, right? So just to, to hit on these ones that show up here, I think we all know at this point the majority of people or the majority of the sales process has already taken place these days before people make contact with the company or a sales individual. You know, if you're like myself, I'm very happy if I can get on, compare products online, uh, and, and make a purchase without talking to anybody, without sending an email, uh, with no interaction. Uh, certainly that's different in the B2B world, uh, but it's getting uh, more and more that they want to be able to get their information in a self-serve uh, kind of manner. Uh, in the e-commerce world, a lot of people tend to add products to their, to their shopping carts, go all the way down to purchase, and then stop. It might even be something as simple as the shipping that's involved for getting those products. But wouldn't it be nice to know that that particular individual loaded up on certain types of products and then abandoned it? And then by, by having that information, being able to go back and market to them and hopefully push them to a sale. And uh, I, I hit on this again, more and more uh, people do not have any patience for bad customer service or a bad customer experience. As little as one misstep uh, can can uh, make somebody go to a competitor. So if we map that customer journey to kind of a more traditional sales funnel, if you will, um, we have lead generation or marketing really, sales, and then customer service at the bottom. Each of these components or each of these functions you know, really can be broken down into stages. Depending on what business you're in and what market you're going after, these stages might be a little bit different. But in order to you know, present today, I'm going to kind of standardize everything. So within each of these stages, there are processes. And so the idea is to be able to have interconnected processes that bring raw leads all the way to, to references, or I like to say leads to loyalty, uh, and all the different curves and turns and branches that can happen uh, in between. You need a platform that, that can, uh, can be modified and nimble enough uh, to, to take that into account. So I'm going to walk through some of the math, I guess, uh, involved in lead generation and sales and kind of how that funnels through uh, an automated process. So in our case here, let's say we start with 30,000 touches or, or contacts, right? Those can come from anywhere. So the world these days is truly omni-channel. You know, social media, email, face-to-face uh, -face for certain um, uh, events, conferences. Leads can come in from anywhere, or I should say contacts can come in from anywhere. The reality is, out of all that traffic, only about 3% get converted to leads. So all the people passing your booth that drop their card, all the people that go onto your site and click around and look at things, even download white papers, only about 3% of that traffic actually turns into leads. The first stage of leads in, in most uh, models is marketing qualified leads. And uh, basically, it's pretty simple to get a marketing qualified lead. They just have to have valid contact information. So out of all the uh, web uh, hits and, and even registrations, this is a step that validates the contact is a, a real email, a real phone number, a, even a social um, media um, uh, login. Uh, the idea is in an automated process, you want to be able to, to systemize as much of this as possible. 
and, and even maybe um, enrich a contact if you can so that they become a market qualified lead. So if somebody put in their name and, and company but didn't put in any contact information, you may have the process in the background be able to search social media and actually pull out an email or, or a, um, a phone number, in which case that will increase your 60% uh, going from raw leads to market leads. The next step down is qualified leads. To get to a qualified lead, we're basically defining that this lead actually has um, a well-defined need, and I would guess that need matches something that you offer. Um, that, that doesn't mean that they're a sales-ready lead. They may be far off from that. And we'll talk about, in, in our, from our perspective, what a sales-ready lead looks like. But at this stage, it may, be, it may make sense to have um, a sub-process. So that, you're going to have processes that go down the middle of your, um, your different functions and then sub-processes that, that are triggered based on certain things. So in this case, this might be a nurturing sub-process that takes somebody that visited a certain page uh, that had to do with cer certain sub-topic, sub-product, blast them an email and say, yeah, we saw you on our website, I thought you might be interested in this. Uh, and from that, tries to get more information out of them and further qualify that uh, particular lead. The reality is, not only will nurturing those leads <clears throat> lead to more of them becoming sales-ready leads, uh, a study, not sure which one, but shows that nurtured leads tend to make 47% larger purchases. So not only are we going to get more people to the table, but they're going to eat some more, and that's all good. The next is handing off to sales-ready leads. So in our mind, coming through the lead process is automated as possible. Uh, we've defined these opportunities as sales ready. What makes something sales ready? Certainly, if you if you have inside sales folks that are that are you know comped on getting leads into the salespeople hand, you want to qualify or set um, uh, you know regulations for how they can hand those off. One very common uh, methodology is called BANT. Stand, I'm sure most of you have heard of this. Uh, it stands for budget, authority, need, and timing. So when I'm talking to a lead or a contact, I need to assure that they have a budget. I'm speaking with somebody who has the authority to act on that budget. The entity, whether it's a company or an individual, actually has the need, and they can, they can uh, describe a, time, a timing. So I'm going to buy it this week. I'm going to buy it this month. I'm going to buy it within a year. Um, in a strict model, you would only allow fully banted opportunities to move into a sales-ready uh, position. The reality is, depending on your market, who you're selling to, how big the opportunity is, I might suggest you, you could go with a less than fully banted opportunity. Let's say uh, you get a lead that definitely has a budget, a need, and they, they define the timing. But you know you're not talking to exactly the right person. The person is going to make a signature. It might make sense to hand that off to sales, uh, who you know, no doubt is really good at tracking down the right person looking for a signature. So not fully banted, but still, in my mind, sales ready. So some of the metrics that you can track, so in each of these functions, you know, lead generation, sales, services, there's all sorts of metrics that you can track. And they're going to vary depending on, uh, you know, what your market is, who your prospects are, what, what, your, uh, what your business is and product. Uh, but here's some pretty typical ones. Again, this is in the lead generation or marketing side. The effectiveness of your lead generation channels. And that can be measured by how many pure leads you get from each channel. And a channel might be social media, it might be a trade show, it might be uh, email blast, whatever it is. Uh, but sometimes just a pure number is not the right way to measure that because it could be that from a trade show you get much larger leads. You might get less of them, but you get larger leads. So it might be value weighted uh, leads uh, from that particular channel. Then another metric is cost per lead. Um, so I talked about trade shows. I think trade shows historically are very expensive cost per lead. Uh, so you spend thousands of dollars to go to the show, to travel, to put people in hotels, the booths, all that stuff. And you may walk away with only a couple hundred leads, uh, but the reality is you hope people who went to that show were there <clears throat> with the objective of purchasing something. As opposed to, you know, an email blast, uh, which you get several thousand responses to, those might not be as qualified to lead and certainly may not be as targeted. 
So you need to, to uh, qualify the metrics that you're capturing as well. Conversion rates per stage, so to be able to consistently capture you know, how many of my marketing qualified leads turn into sales qualified leads. If you capture that number and it tends to go up and down depending on the campaign, you, you're going to want to qualify what, what types of campaigns are bringing it down versus up and again try and tweak that uh, conversion rate. So if you think of the conversion rates as knobs on the valves in your, in your pipeline, uh, each of those conversion rates gives you the ability to either open it up or close it down. Uh, you just need to figure out uh, which direction they need to be turned, I guess. Uh, conversion time. So if you have a very consistent process and your conversion rates are very consistent, but all of a sudden things are slowing down for some reason, you may want to look at particular stages in your process. Maybe you've added some T's and C's to your contract that are slowing down the contract process, or maybe, I'm sorry, we're on the marketing side, maybe you're slowing down your qualification process, or maybe you don't have enough bandwidth to handle all the leads that you have, and so the response time to your leads is getting slow. Uh, all sorts of questions. But if you don't measure them, you can't manage them. And then the last one really is band. Is this thing ready to move on to sales? So a little bit of a checklist. Sorry, excuse me. So first of all, you want to be capturing leads from all the different channels into CRM. A lot of people will capture, you know, just the digital leads that come in. The reality is all those leads that come from, you know, road shows, trade shows, uh, just regular phone calls, they need to be added into the mix so that you can get a full um, a qualification of all those different channels. Effective lead generation, uh, effectiveness of those different channels needs to be measured as we spoke about. Um, the qualification of leads and nurturing them until they're sales ready, so not just throwing non-banted or thinly banted uh, opportunities over the fence, uh, can, be, can be cut down by having an automated nurturing process. In the real estate market, we actually look at, um, you know, if you look at a broker's book as 100%, about 90% of those opportunities generally are just kicking tires. They're just looking at properties. They're not ready to buy. And only 10% is really ready to buy we would say that you take the 90% and put them into a nurturing process that feeds them newsletters, new listings, all sorts of things until they show uh, digitally the, the interest level going up and then they get moved into uh, the 10% and get fully, um, fully uh, prosecuted, if you will. Tough word. So moving on from leads into opportunities. So from the lead generation uh, phase into sales uh, production, if you will. If we say we had a thousand leads, uh, raw leads from the beginning of that uh, marketing or lead generation exercise, on average about 13 to 22% of people's leads become opportunities. So in our case, we're gonna say about 15% became opportunities. Now we step into the sales process, and we talk about having dynamic sales processes. The idea is, even within the same company, you may have multiple sales processes or multiple types of sales, from e-commerce to channel sales to B2B. Certainly the process end-to-end -end is very different. E-commerce might be totally self-serving. Uh, they click on their purchase, they put in their credit card, and it's done. Uh, whereas channel sales, it may go through that channel representative uh, into your own sales uh, bullpen uh, and back and forth. The idea is you need a platform that allows you to have multiple processes that can be run simultaneously and triggered based on the situation. So what type of sale it is, what product it is, maybe even what customer it is because certain customers may have you know, a, a, a speed pass, if you will, to make purchases. So the first stage of the sales process, and again, uh, understanding that there are all sorts of unique sales processes, short and long and, and multi-armed, if you will, and we're going to take a pretty standard slice through that. So needs analysis, presentation, proposal, negotiation, contracting, and hopefully one. So if we go into needs analysis and we say that 150 uh, opportunities enter needs analysis. Uh, stat here, sales reps spend almost one day a week uh, digging up information, not for a presentation or a tailored demo, but just to make that next phone call. That's a kind of scary thing that they're spending that amount of time. The 
The idea is if you have an automated process that has the ability to enrich those contacts or opportunity accounts, so reach out to uh, a DMB or a Zoom info or social media and uh, add information, that's going to cut down on the amount of uh, time a sales rep is going to need to drill down and just do random research. Moving to presentations. Uh, again, sales resources tend to spend a lot of time building custom presentations. And the reality is as a corporation or as a sales manager or a marketing manager, you don't want them coming up with their own version of the truth, if you will. You, wanna, you work very hard on consistent marketing messages and corporate messages uh, and messaging, and you want that to be consistent. So by building in collateral and presentations and access to knowledge base within the automated process and feeding that to uh, the sales rep, you know, based on the product that they're presenting, based on the client that they're going to see, it's going to cut down a lot of that time and make it much more, um, uh, it's going to leverage all the experience that you've put into building presentations. The reality is only about a third, uh, or there's a probability of about a third of a, a deal closing just based off the presentation stage. Even when you're buying a car, you usually get past the presentation stage. They always say the best thing to do buying a car is walk out the door because they're going to call you and give you a better deal. Moving on to the proposal stage, um, you know the, the, the quote here I think is pretty obvious, right? To go through all the trouble of building a, a personalized presentation, uh, uh, proposal, if you will, and leaving it on the desk to be delivered uh, to the decision maker is far less efficient or effective than getting in front of that decision maker, handing them that proposal, and pr probably presenting it at the same time. Uh, you know, I think any of us in sales would realize that, and sometimes it's just difficult to get to that decision maker. But you can make that part of your process. You can make that a requirement that you know you're not going to deliver a proposal until you get access to that decision maker. Here again, having a knowledge base that holds the components that make up a proposal should make it easier and more consistent uh, for a sales rep uh, to put together to construct um, a proposal before delivery. And you'll see our numbers clicking down, and that's really showing the conversion rate as we go through the different stages. Uh, you know, I look at the numbers we used in this case, and there are certainly months that I'd be really happy to have some of these numbers. Um, but the bottom line is, if you noticed from proposal stage to negotiation, one month you're 110 to 60, and the next month you go from 110 to 5, maybe there's something going wrong in your proposals. Uh, maybe, maybe the market has passed you by and your pricing is off. Uh, it basically is a trigger to go look at uh, that previous stage and why you're not making the, the um, uh, navigating to the next stage. So. Uh, you know, here again, the, we all know the longer negotiations go on, the lower probability something's going to close. The more you nick and knack back and forth with T's and C's and pricing, uh, usually the less comfortable people are doing business with you. You start to show yourself as being not easy to do business with. One way to get around this is to arm the sales force with kind of pre-negotiated options. So if they ask for 10%, you can offer on a certain product, you can offer them 7%. If they ask for free delivery, you can offer them um, you know, uh, two months of maintenance or something like that. But having a, a preset uh, playbook for negotiation, rather than having the rep or sales individual you know, either making it up on the fly or constantly saying, okay, well, I'll take that back to the office. Uh, is makes it a much more efficient and cuts, cuts down the time of the negotiation stage. I, you know, similarly with contracting, you know, doing the paperwork. Uh, I, I had a sales force once where we took the contracting out of their hands because it was taking too much time and they really didn't have the authority to make any call on liability uh, or, you know, any, any of the legal terms. So we took that on and tried to make it more efficient. And what they found was the turnaround on contracts was quicker um, because they, we forced the sales guys to ask the client for all of their exceptions up front. You never get them all, but hopefully you get most of them, so that myself and the general counsel could sit down and very quickly bang through them. So again, building that into the process. And then closed one. And again, Go, if we only lost one deal, went from 11 in contracting to 10 closed, I'm going to say we, we had a great contracting process.
Sorry, I have something just blocking a part of my screen. There we go. So a couple just headlines as to what the benefits of having a, an automated, systemized, um, you know, uh, sales process in place. First is as you as you walk somebody through the process. So if the if the system actually walks walks an opportunity through the methodology, uh, it's much easier to onboard new sales. So if you plug somebody into the sales system and they get a lead and it gets qualified and it asks them for the next, tells them the next steps they should take, uh, the onboarding curve, the learning curve is much quicker. The other thing is if you're tracking all these metrics, you can, you can use them in gamification and use it as a bit of incentive. So uh, we use our own products here. Our sales guys have a dashboard and on the side of the dashboard it shows their metrics for the day shows how they're doing versus their uh, their colleagues um, you know and, and I think it drives a little bit of competition the second one there is by having a standardized process uh, you can be better assured that everybody is following that process and therefore the 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 opportunities as they go through the, the pipe and as they pick up probabilities to close tend to be more accurate as opposed to 100 sales guys, you know, following the methodology the way they want to and putting in probabilities and moving them from stage to stage as they see fit, um, having a systematic automated um, process uh, allows for much more consistency there. And then finally, tracking uh, and uh, closely monitoring the key metrics is what it's all about. If you can't, if it's not repeatable, you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, you really can't improve it. Uh, or try and find out what's going wrong. So some of the key metrics for sales that we look at, number of opportunities in the pipeline, that's kind of like qualifying your channels for uh, leads. It might not necessarily be the number particularly, uh, but it could be the value weighted number of opportunities in the pipeline. Or, uh, and that's the second uh, metric, weighted pipeline total, the probability value weight of the pipeline. And the reality is looking at the sheer number of deals and trying to balance them across uh, a certain number of reps you know, is very important so that one person isn't overloaded when another person is looking for work to do. You know, an automated system, uh, a, 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 an agile system can do that uh, on its own as well. It can self-weight things. Conversion by stage, we talked about that. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Uh, average sales cycle. So if you're seen at a particular stage in the in the process, uh, things are taking longer than they used to. Again, it might be what you're presenting. It might be your product has lost the market. It might be your pricing is off, uh, and it might be a place to look for improvement. And then average deal uh, size. I guess um, one of the things I always say is people do what they're incented to do. And I've had times in my career where wow, we were selling, selling a crazy number of a certain type of product, but we really wanted to sell this other product. And what it was was the sales team had figured out, well, they could make more money based on the, the comp plan uh, by selling more units of this easier to sell product. And so we changed the incentive plan and, and got a little closer to what we wanted. But average deal size can be a, a flag to that, you know, that your incentive plan or pricing is, is off. So a little bit of a checklist here for sales, and again, the key is that all opportunities are captured in the system. You can't have some in and some out and try and build an, a, an accurate pipeline or accurate forecast. You know, I used to say uh, when I was implementing a product from the start and the sales team was not accustomed to having to enter everything in there, said if it's not in the CRM, it doesn't exist. So if I don't see that deal as an opportunity in my CRM, you know, I'm not going to give you resources for it, and actually, if it closes, I'm not going to pay you on it. Uh, that actually happened, and it was amazing how quick uh, sales guys uh, began entering their information into the pipeline. But bottom line, the tool is only as good as uh, people use it, uh, and it's only as good as the information that they put into it. Uh, tactics and key, key participants and approach, you know, I would say this is important at each stage. And so, um, you know, a process-driven CRM or sales automation tool can actually uh, put required steps. So you have to stop and do a SWOT analysis at a particular time. You know, for a small uh, opportunity, that may seem like somewhat of a waste of time. 
but maybe it's just a bit of a check the box. For a larger opportunity, it's a chance to step back and realize that that sales rep actually did conduct that uh, SWOT analysis. And when you're doing a pipeline analysis, you can actually stop and, and look at that. So at each uh, conversion stage, having the process uh, initiate the proper actions is very important and, and adds consistency. So that really brings us through uh, lead generation and sales. Uh, and you know the final hurrah is really service and retention and cross-sale. Uh, so actually, I thought I'd stop right here and ask a or field a couple questions that have come in. Um, so let me take a look here. What, uh, what are the criteria that matter most during the early stages of a sale? Hmm. So the criteria that matter most. I, I think the early stages of a sale, and this is my personal opinion, having run sales groups in multiple uh, industries, well, mostly the technology industry, but multiple solutions, the biggest thing is to requalify that BANT and be sure that when the person who told you they had authority actually had the authority and there really was a budget and that you're not just chasing down a rat hole. So I think the most important thing early in the sales process is to reconfirm that, reconfirm their requirements, and uh, you know, um, re, um, restate uh, your value in how you're going to respond to those requirements. Always, I, well, the other thing I've seen early in a sales cycle is uh, a, usually in a young, a newer sales guy, always going back to feature function, feature function. This is what we do best. You really need to listen to that client and understand what pain point they're they're really talking about and map that to your feature function. So let's take another one here. Um, if the company decides to automate sales process, what should they start with? Hmm. So again, BPM Online offers marketing automation, sales automation, and service automation. And I would say generally we find that it's the sales piece that people start with. Um, what we find pretty quickly is they say, well, where are the leads coming from and how are we getting into, the, into that sales process? But uh, getting a, a good process of capturing the leads uh, into uh, that automated sales process. So it comes in as a qualified lead. It gets uh, handed off or assigned to a particular um, uh, rep, uh, and you're off and running. And if the sales process is automated, then uh, you're not necessarily worried about where those leads are coming from. So I would say probably sales automation is the first piece we see people coming to the table with, and then a lot of times backing into marketing automation as it's connected uh, to sales. Maybe one more here. Um, we manage our sales process semi-manually. I like that. I think that's probably most people. In, in, is sales process automation worth investing? Hmm. So, you know, obviously my answer would be yes. And, and I guess it depends on how many sales rep you have and how, how efficient you think your semi-manual process is. Uh, but what I've found, even with a small team, uh, you know, again, you can have a sales methodology that you put in place. It's only as good as people follow it and that you can map to. So I will admit that I've had sales teams where when I put together my forecast, it was very different than the true probability weighted output of the system. And that's because I knew my sales guys. I knew one guy was optimistic, one guy was pessimistic, and they played with the numbers. And so having that automated sales process that puts limits or guidelines on when they can move it from stage to stage, because actually the system moves it from stage to stage, and what that probability can, can actually be, uh, leads to a much more consistent um, forecast. So regardless of the size of the team, you know, I think it's important, or, or you, you will certainly gain benefit from it. So actually, why don't we uh, move on, and hopefully at the end, uh, we'll have a little bit more time uh, to answer some questions. Hopefully that was helpful. Again, it's just my opinion. <laughs> so uh, I have the benefit of giving that right now. But uh, honestly, if anybody has questions or input uh, directly to me, I'm sure my contact information is on the end of this. Love to talk to you. So we're going to move on to uh, the customer service area, the final frontier, if you will. So we've gotten them across the door, uh, their existing customer. We want to make them a loyal customer. 
I love this stat that's right here. 80% of the companies think they're doing a great job at customer service, but only 8% of their customers of the same clients, of the same companies, would say the same. Obviously, we got to work harder to get both of them to the 80%, to level off the expectations, to understand why they're saying it's only 8%. Um, Right, so the whole goal is to, once you've worked so hard to get a customer, to retain that customer, and then to repeat, cross, or upsell that customer. I think the adage goes, you know, it's a uh, hundred times more expensive, I'm making up a number there, a hundred times more expensive to earn a new client than it is to sell to an existing client. The other thing, important point, important, important point here, sorry, uh, is that, and it talks about Gen, Gen Y customers. I think we're all, our, our expectations have all become much sharper uh, just based on, uh, you know, the access we have through the internet and e-commerce. So one bad experience can sour your relationship with any company very quickly. So it's very important uh, that you have consistency uh, across the entire company uh, from from marketing sales and on to service as to how people are treated and what their uh, what the customer experience is the overall customer experience is um, the other thing here it says 85 percent will tell somebody about it that's the old the other old adage you know a happy customer will tell one person but an unhappy customer will tell ten well that's back from before social media so now if an unhappy person tweets to ten people uh, it can get out to a much bigger audience. Uh, so my advice is, if you have happy customers, uh, get them to tweet about you. And then with respect to references, so happy customers tell other people to buy your products. The reality is a reference lead is twice as likely to convert than any other lead, really. So if they had a personal friend or a business colleague tell them, hey, this, this product is solid, this product is worth buying, you're twice as likely likely to make that sale. So in the land of service, actually, there's probably more metrics that can be tracked uh, depending on your, your services and offering uh, than all of sales and marketing combined. There's SLAs, there's average time to response, to resolution, satisfaction rate. Uh, but the, really, the reality is, particularly in the technology world these days with you know, recurring revenue and so the subscription model is you need to keep the customer churn rates down. And the way to do that is to keep them happy, right? We need to keep the customers happy. We need to give them a solid customer experience uh, so that they stay with us, uh, buy more, and continue to uh, re-up uh, their subscriptions. So a little checklist with respect to services. Um, Again, the key is customer churn, keeping it low. If you think about it, if customer churn uh, is above 5% uh, and you're not, you're not increasing your sales by more than that, so if customer churn is higher than your new sales, you're, you're, you're shrinking. You're not growing anymore, right? So customer churn is very important. Um, the other thing is, particularly for customer service, you need to be omni-channel. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't even think about how I interface with my bank. Uh, if I actually do walk into the teller for whatever purpose, buying a bank check or whatever it might be, uh, that's not very often. I use the ATM, I use my cell phone, I might actually call, I might use the computer. The reality is my expectation is that my experience will be exactly the same no matter what I do, meaning no matter how I make a transaction, you know, they're aware of it, uh, they know everything I've done, and my balance uh, reflects that. So. From a customer service point of view, uh, as well as marketing and sales, you need to truly be omnichannel these days. In that, uh, you need to listen to the customer. So again, retention of the customer is probably the, one of the most important thing, if not the most important thing, depending on the life uh, cycle of your company. Um, but being able to communicate with them and listening, listen to what they say. So if somebody tweets the same comment to you three times, uh, your reference manual is unreadable, your reference manual is unreadable, your reference manual is unreadable, you might want to respond to that and come out with something that's a little more uh, conducive. 
So the bottom line is, you know, you want to optimize business processes from sales, marketing, and services. And if you think of all the different conversion steps as you go through the stages, if you can tweak each one of them by 1%, you're certainly going to gain a lot, but just a handful of them, and you, you could increase revenue by 10%, you know, fairly easily. On the other side, if you're not watching them and they're decreasing, uh, your conversion rates are going down, you, you shouldn't be surprised that revenue is going down as well. So again, you can't, you can't improve what you don't measure. And so all the stats out there, here's some more stats. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly where all these came from, but they all point to the same thing, that efficient sales processes, efficient processes in general, uh, are going to lead to better performance and more likelihood that you're going to hit your targets. Okay, so I thought, so that's a lot of statistics, a lot of talk about the pipeline, a lot of talk about process, uh, and really the, the idea of this presentation was really about not just putting process in place, but how can you change them quickly, or why is it important to be able to change them quickly? How do agile processes allow for dynamic growth? And, and so we thought it would be interesting to look at a, an actual case study. One of our clients um, happens to be ArmTech. Uh, they are a European automotive wholesaler retailer, mostly parts and uh, you know complementary products. Historian, you know, so fairly large, 5,000 employees, uh, mid 90s. They were founded. They have over a quarter million products that they deal with. Um, so pretty large operation. Historically, they have focused on enterprise uh, organizations and large distributors. Um, so the owners of owners of you know, store sh storefronts. Uh, and they're looking to, or they were looking to, increase their market uh, share, uh, increase revenue, uh, basically just grow their business. And felt that the you know, enterprise target and, 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 and large distributor, that marketplace, was uh, you know, a little bit crowded or a little bit tapped out. And so they came up with a pretty simple decision. We're going to go after SMB. They took a look at their product offering and they realized that a lot of these things get sold at auto parts stores, uh, get sold at auto shops, get sold at, uh, through dealerships. Uh, and that was a very different approach for them to go after this um, SMB market. So a simple decision by these young executives, they decided this is the way we're going to go. And what we're going to do is walk through kind of the trickle effect of that with respect to their processes. So obviously this is a BPM online uh, customer. They'd already put in place a bunch of different processes across the different functions. And now they've got to look at how they're going to alter it and how they're going to um, you know, uh, execute on this uh, board level uh, initiative. So let's start with sales. So first thing they did was hire a new sales, sales VP to focus on SMB, a uh, very different business. Uh, and uh, so he's all excited. The first thing he looks at is their corporate sales process. So this is actually a view out of uh, BPM Online of a kind of standard long sales process. And you'll see the stack of blue uh, boxes. Those are all each sub-processes and they kind of follow your kind of, I'd say, Miller-Hyman-ish uh, standard process. Qualification, needs analysis, presentation, proposal generation, etc., etc., etc. Well, he looked at that and said, well, this is great for large entity enterprise type sales. But when I'm selling to these smaller businesses, uh, I, I'm not going to need these steps. So the, the formal needs analysis, he decided, well, we're, we're just going to pull that out. They're going to do this stuff over the phone. We're going to offer them packaged product deals. Uh, so it's going to be more of a catalog-based thing and maybe web-focused. Uh, web, uh, um, a formal presentation that used to take a, you know, a week or so or maybe even a month to put together these massive proposals. Uh, to gain a new enterprise client. We're going to take that out. The reality is we instantly you know, streamline this process. The other thing he noticed was the negotiation sub-process you know, was all about face-to-face -face handshakes across the table. And uh, the reality was that was going to be much simpler in the small business. And actually, if you look over at the right, the system allows you to put in hints or, or suggestions for next steps or rules and regulations. And so he put in place, you know, so when the new small market sales guy comes in and he's in his process, even on his mobile phone, uh, it can come up and suggest some negotiation tactics. 
You also realize this is not going to take place as a visit, but rather as a call. And so with a couple clicks, he was able to change the process. And so literally BPM Online is designed for an end user really to be able to modify these processes and save them. And the other thing to point out is the old process is not gone. Uh, the two processes can coexist and they can be triggered depending on you know, who the client is or the segment uh, of the market that you're going after. The other thing you wanted to institute was some level of guided selling. So they're going after a much larger number of accounts uh, with more junior salespeople uh, more of a field sales orientation. And he wanted them to walk in the door with a set set of tasks that they're going to execute at each visit. So the system allows him to set up a queue, if you will, of tasks uh, that when the individual is in the field on a mobile device, in this case a tablet, but it could be a phone, they're going to get this view. And so on the left you see it's actually their calendar of meetings can actually be integrated or is integrated with a mapping function. So if they, they need directions from one to the other, you can get that. But as they walk in the door, they can actually slide the, the switch and say, OK, I'm checking in. I'm at, the, I'm at the meeting. In the background, it's actually taking a timestamp and a GPS stamp, a little bit big brotherish. But the idea is to be able to, to um, capture and, um, and, and then uh, mod, um, accumulate those experiences and so they can uh, better analyze you know where they're spending their time are things taking too long in certain steps and and just uh, streamline that process so it tells them to do a live presentation you might notice down below he's got instant access to the corporate presentation it says receive orders what you don't see here is it can have an automatic link to their online catalog where he can place an order uh, he can actually generate an invoice here he could actually take payment here and then he checks out. So he was able to put in place pretty simply, you know, that that field sales uh, remote uh, capability, all driven by a process that's in the background. Uh, so again, process-driven uh, sales automation. The next thing he needed to do was modify dashboards or create dashboards that gave them a, a better view of this higher volume type operation. So much higher volume of leads than they had ever gone for. Uh, if, when they were going to the enterprise space, you know, they knew who their target accounts were. They knew who their contacts were. This is all web-based. We're going to see the marketing piece in a bit. But this is all web-based inbound type leads. So he needed to define a dashboard that very simply visualized that information. The product allowed him to go in, pick which type of object he wants, in this case a pie chart, map that to the screenscape, if you will, you know, really click, point, and shoot, and literally in a matter of minutes, 10, 15 minutes, uh, he could generate a dashboard that looked like this and would show him the types of leads and how they're flowing through the process, what channels they're coming from. So on to our sales associate. Uh, she's all excited. She gets to go after a more digitally focused market, I guess you'd say. And so in her mind, this old process, so surprise, surprise, she also uses processes behind her marketing campaigns. This was more, uh, you know, person to person driven. So an audience got invitations to an event, uh, and what she wanted to do was back that up to, uh, you know, email driven landing page website uh, audience uh, gathering, if you will. And so she was very easily, very easily able to concatenate that front end and create a landing page launch that sent out an email that uh, judged interest and then led them into the invitation, the reminder, and the event. On top of that, she wasn't going to be sending out the same collateral that she sent out to the enterprise. Enterprise more worried about fleets of large trucks, whereas you know the auto body shop or auto parts shop might be interested more in complementary products and parts, etc. So very easily in the content designer, which is part of the product, She's able to drag and drop uh, images. She's able to change the content. She's actually able to add this uh, discount specifically focused on the small business market, which also uh, contains a click that takes them to the landing page, that allows them to register, that pulls them in as a lead, that's going to show up in the, the um, VPS sales dashboard. So all these leads that are coming in, she's also able to track uh, by source, by channel, uh, by type. And that leads us to, again, client service. 
Uh, and so in client service, actually, they looked at this, and again, thinking of the volumes they're going to be approached with and the kind of less personal approach, uh, they really didn't want to hire out enough people to handle a contact center in-house. So they're going to outsource the contact center. Uh, this is their client service process as it stands. It's very personalized. When, when enterprise clients call in, they get their account manager. Um, you know, it, it's... it's um, it's not, uh, it's not just pick up uh, the next call on the queue. Uh, so basically when they got a call from a large client, they would immediately go on site to investigate. That's not necessarily going to happen anymore with these small accounts. Uh, and so uh, you're able to take that step out of the link. Uh, and what you need to do, so we're going to create, we're going to hire an outsourced call center. But they need to be, have access to the system. They need to be part of the org's organizational structure within the system. So we're simply able to uh, create a division called the Outsource Contact Center. And the big thing is he wants to give specific access to those types of users. So rather than full access where they can edit and add, they're really just going to have um, um, read access to some of that data and probably input access for new cases. The other thing you wanted to do specifically for that call center, whereas the internal uh, contact center is able to look at an entire queue of incoming calls or cases, and if you will, cherry pick the ones that want to go after first, maybe because they know somebody better, maybe because they know the issue is not difficult. <laughs> they don't want to give the outsourced call center you know, access to that. They want to give them the next highest priority. So they create what's called a blind queue, and what that means is the agent only sees the next highest priority case. Actually, this is a view of our agent uh, home page, if you will. See a little bit of gamification on the right-hand side that's just leveraging our dashboard capabilities. The middle is actually a chat function, uh, so inter-system inter social network that's available to any user. And then if you had a non, an unblind queue, if you will, a full queue, you'd see all of your cases here. In this case, he's just seeing the next one that he can grab, uh, uh, that he can take on to work. Put all those changes in place, launch the marketing campaign, start handling those new leads, and uh, the executives to sit back and look at the uh, results on their newly formed dashboards. Uh, so uh, the bottom line is the only constant is change, another old adage, but you need a system. Uh, so not only do you need or you should be looking to automate uh, marketing sales and services processes, you need to have them agile enough to be able to expand, modify, and change uh, to the market and your customers. So I blew that right up to about six minutes or so, I think. Uh, we might have time for a couple calls, um, I mean a couple of questions. So why is it important to make changes to the sales process fast? Well, I think going back to the very first slide, uh, you know, if you're thinking about it, somebody else is doing it. So, you know, in the example of the case, uh, they decided they're going to go to a small business market. People had already been there. So they wanted to be able to alter their process to make that approach super efficient as quickly as possible. I think that's just one example. You know, uh, you know I know silence is deadly in sales. The la you know, lack of timely response is also deadly in sales. Uh, let me see. Uh, how cooperation of sales and service units can help increase revenue? Great question. Um, and actually, uh, it, marketing can also help uh, cust uh, customer support. So if you have all the information, so if you have a single platform where a contact and an, an, uh, an account exists in the same database across all those functions, marketing, sales, and services. The data behind that, the history behind that, the product preferences, the channel preferences, all that behavioral information is all captured in one. And so a customer, uh, you know, customer service, having customer service within the same database, sales, sales folks, whether they're hunters and farmers or they can do both, can access that information to understand customers' buying preferences. Uh, might lead them to offer complementary products or upsells, or they could notice that, oh, they've been buying five on a monthly basis, and so I should start offering them seven or something like that. Likewise, uh, customer service going back to marketing, you can leverage marketing for loyalty campaigns. So based on 
you know, a particular customer's buying habits or quantity, you can trigger a, a campaign that offers them discounts, that offers them complimentary products, etc. I think we're almost out of time, but let me take another call here. Another call, another question, like I'm on call radio. Um, should companies use best practice processes or design and implement their own, taking into account their customers' business speci specifics and experience? Another great question. What we've so first of all, BPM Online comes. We, we certainly give you a business process engine that you can design. Actually, you saw it there when I was clicking through and making changes. That you can design processes from scratch, no doubt. Uh, but we don't just offer you a blank slate and say, go get it. We have a library of pre-built practices, uh, you know, built up from our existing customers, and basically we have a research team that constantly goes through and tweaks those um, that you can start with. So I would say the majority of our clients pick the process, the existing process that's closest to theirs, maybe even work with it for a number of months, gain the feedback, and then modify it over time. And as we've been talking about here, sometimes modify it month to month and try out different uh, versions of it and either fall back to the first one or move forward uh, to the new one or, or, or whatever or different variants. Uh, the system also allows you to make changes to a process and uh, determine whether all existing cases will continue to file, follow the old process or, or you know, so be grandfathered in the old process or will automatically take the new path. Uh, just a, an added feature. Can you interface with Google Apps? Uh, definitely can interface with Google Apps. Actually, Gmail uh, is a two-way synchronization if you want. Uh, one thing I don't think I highlighted, maybe a little bit, the system has uh, email capabilities, calendaring capabilities. Uh, and so if you send an email from the system to a client and you're integrated with your, your uh, Google Apps, uh, your Gmail, it's going to synchronize there or with Outlook. Or we have a few uh, that use other systems as well. So product cost. So I'll, I'll use the typical sales guy answer, and that really depends. Um, our product is based on, usually on user counts. Um, you can buy marketing, sales, and services separately. Uh, you can buy a bundle of any two combination or the three, and there's pricing that goes with each of them. You can have a mix of users that, you know, a super user that has all three, uh, sales users, marketing users, and service users. Um, but I will say that, generally speaking, if you are in the market and you're looking at uh, competitive pricing, uh, we pen, tend to be very efficient. And maybe one last question. I have 5.59 on my clock right now. Hopefully, I won't get cut off. What is the average user adoption period for your system, including all the trainings? Uh, I mean, that, that is a tough question. So if it's a small shop and you're just plugging in out-of-the-box sales management, so I will say we use our own products in-house and we use our out-of-the-box sales process. And frankly, to turn that on and get people running on it, uh, it, it's a matter of weeks. A new sales guy walks in the door here and adopts it within, within a week. And part of that is uh, an opportunity. So a lead gets assigned to that person. They qualify it. It creates an opportunity. The opportunity walks itself through the, the sales methodology, and so really uh, the sales rep's kind of along for the ride because the system tells them what's next, uh, and th then it's up to them to take the actions and put in the response. I got to tell you, we're out of time right now. Uh, I really appreciate the time. I hope this was informational for folks. I hope uh, there's some interest out there, and you know, certainly contact me uh, with any questions. But here's my information. Um, uh, feel free to contact us uh, and certainly contact Jeff about the association. Jeff, thanks again for uh, hosting us and um, I hope to hear from everybody. Have a great day.